Our speaker this evening is the current bishop of the Armenian Catholic Eparchy of Our Lady of Nareg in the United States and Canada. Most Reverend Mikhail Muradian was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and completed his seminary studies in Rome at the Pontifical Armenian College, earning licentiate degrees in theology and philosophy. He was ordained a priest in 1987 and served in various missions in Lebanon, Syria, and Armenia. He was ordained as the Bishop of the Eparchy of Our Lady of Nareg in 2011. Bishop Mikhail currently is the Secretary of the Armenian Catholic Synod of Bishops and serves as a co-chair of the Armenian American Museum and also as a member of the Armenian Genocide Committee. Please welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Bishop Mikhail Muradyan. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace, the King of the Universe. We are gathered on the web today to think together about our brothers and sisters who are suffering in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, to understand better the situation in which they are, to study their story, and through their story to reconnect with you and to ask you again and again, Prince of Peace, give us peace. Amen. Again, good evening, everyone. And I thank the Peter and all the group that working in the Institute for having me today. So what I'm going to do today is to speak a little bit about the history of the Armenian church, but to go in depth much more in the background of the actual situation where our 120,000 Armenian Christian brothers and sisters are living a blockade since December 12, 2022. So what we are going to do is first of all, a geopolitical history of Armenia, then the history of the baptism of the Armenia, Armenian nation, and the geopolitical consequences of it. And then the Catholic church in the Armenian nation. Armenia geopolitically now is in the Caucasus region. And it's one of the 15 former Soviet countries of the former Soviet Union. It is actually surrounded politically on the map. In the West, there is Turkey, in the East, Azerbaijan, and in the South, Iran. In the North is Georgia, the sole country that is Christian other than Armenia is Georgia on the North. And since the independence of Armenia in 1991, Turkey and Azerbaijan, who have the biggest border with Armenia on the east and the west, they have put it a blockade. Territorial blockade, so nobody can go in or out of Armenia. The sole way to go to Armenia is by airplane nowadays. The region where our brothers and sisters are surrounded, the 120, thousand Armenians. I will speak about it later on after I present the history of the region. It is the region of nagorno karabakh that you see on the map, that part, which is completely blockaded now from the Azer Azerbaijani military for almost nine months now. So 120 people are living over there for almost 250 days, no water, no electricity, no gas, and uh, nutrition is very scarce. Even the International Red Cross cannot pass through the blockade to help them. 
to understand why the situation came up, we have to go back in history. Okay. The region about which we're going to speak is the Caucasian Middle Eastern region. Armenia on this map is on the far east of the map. This map is from almost 300, 400 before Jesus Christ. That was the situation. And when you look into the map, you don't read the word Turkey or the word Azerbaijan. They don't exist back in that time. Armenia is there. So how Armenia came to exist? This is the statue of Haig. In the Armenian mythology, he is the founder of the Armenian nations. Actually, Armenian in Armenian language is called Hai after the name of this ancestor whose name was Haig. So Haig, Hai. The Armenian mythology tells us that Haig was living in Babylonia. And when the languages were mixed in Babylonia, he took his family and came back to the Mount Ararat where the Arch of Noe crashed after the flood. And he established a country over there. But the king of Babylon wasn't happy with him. So the king of Babylon came to retake him as a prisoner to Babylonia. And there was a fight, according to the mythology, during the fighting, Haig who was a very good archer, killed the Babylonian king. And so he gained the independence. The idea behind the mythology is that Armenian people are keen of freedom. We cannot live without freedom. And that's something that it is in the Armenian gen. And that's why, because of all the persecutions that later on Armenians are going to live, we had always to flee where we're living, our ancestors, to be able to live in freedom. Just to give you an idea how old Armenia is, this is a leather shoe that was found in Armenia during the excavation. It dates from 5,500 years ago. Can you imagine? There was already a nation who had craftsmanship some 5,000 years ago on these lands. And nowadays there are people who are saying to these people, go away from here, this is not your land. As every nation, the Armenian nation began with a little kingdom. This is the first known Armenian kingdom in the world, Urardu. The kingdom of Urardu was established in the ninth century before Jesus Christ and stood there till the sixth century before Jesus Christ. It was established by an Armenian prince whose name was Arkishti I in 785 before Jesus Christ. And what was typical for this land that they were uh, in their mythology, they had relations to the Old Testament. Actually in the excavation that, that they did in the capital of this uh, old Armenian kingdom, which is the actual capital of Armenia, Yerevan, they found an helmet. On the helmet is curved the tree of life. So according to the Armenian tradition, 
because of what we see in the Old Testament about the place of the paradise on earth, where there, there is the source of two, the two big uh, rivers, the Euphrates and the Decrees River. So the people of the region thought always that the paradise was there and the tree of life was also there, but they couldn't find it. So to protect themselves during war, they used to craft the tree of life on the helmets of their soldiers. After the collapse of the Urardu kingdom, there was another dynasty that came up in the Armenian nation, 330 before Christ. And it was called the Ervantuni dynasty, which was founded by an Armenian prince whose name was Yervant. And if you look, it is called Greater Armenia because it has much more territory than the actual Armenia that is now in the Caucasus region. Actual Armenia is only 29,000 kilometers square and has nothing to do with the Lake of Van, which is in the middle of this map. If you see it, the blue thing, Peter, if you can point to it, please. Okay, this, this lake of Van now is in the map of Turkey. So back in history, Armenia was controlling all these territories. And this kingdom remained till the conquer by, by Alexander the Great, who conquered even the Persian empire back in that time in 331. And after the death of Alexander the Great in 323, his kingdom was divided into several little king, kingdoms and a new di dynasty came up in Armenia, historical Armenia. It was called the Arkhadidas dynasty, uh, the Ardashesian dynasty. Ardashes I founded this dynasty, but the one that grow this dynasty is his grandson, Dikranes II of Armenia, who was called the king of the kings because he extended his empire, imagine, till Jerusalem, from Armenia till Jerusalem. So he was called the king of kings because every kingdom that he conquered, he used, as we're seeing in this depicted image to mount his horse and all the other kings that he conquered their kingdom should walk in front of him on feet. That's how he was showing his strength among the other rulers. This is the kingdom of Dikranes the Great, which was dated from 95 to 55 before Christ. So if you look, you have the Gaspian Sea on the east. Peter, if you can show it, please. So this Gaspian Sea now is the border, the eastern border of Azerbaijan. And all the territory that is greater Armenia is now part of Azerbaijan and part of Turkey until 55 before Christ, Dikran ruled till Jerusalem and Judea in the south. That's why suddenly after 55 before Jesus Christ, the Roman empire expanded directly to Jerusalem because 
there was a war that was fought between Dikran the Great and the Romans. These two Roman generals, the first one on your left is Lucius Lucullus, and the second one on your right is Pompey Manius. Pompey that was killed by Caesar Augustus, if you remember in history. So these two generals fought against Dicranes. After three battles, they could defeat him, but they didn't dethrone him. He remained a vassal king of the Roman Empire, and all the territories that he had conquered till Jerusalem have begun being part of the Roman Empire. That's why in 55 before Jesus Christ, the Roman Empire expanded directly from Asia Minor till Jerusalem. After they conquered the empire of Dicranes the Great. The last descendants of Dicranes the Great, his name was Dicranes the Fifth, ruled Armenia as a Roman client king from sixth Anno Domini to twelfth Anno Domini. So the kingdom of Dicranes the Great ruled till the year 12 of our Lord. This is the part where the providence of the Lord is entering in the history of Armenia. So these are two people. One is standing and the other is down because he, he was stabbed. The one who is standing is the father of Gregory the Illuminator, the person who brought the light of Jesus Christ to Armenia. And the king who is lying, murdered, is the father of King Dertades III, who is the king who accepted the Christianity in the Armenia. So what happened? Khosrov, who is, was the, the king of Armenia in the year 238, Anno Domini, had war against the Persian kingdom. And the king of Persia, Ardashir, couldn't get rid of him because Khosrov II was very strong. So he decided that he will plot against Khosrov. So he called Anag, the one who is standing in the picture, who used to be a Persian prince and told him, you're going to the Armenian king and you tell him that I am persecuting you. You befriend him. Then when you have the opportunity, you kill him. You assassinate him. And that's what happened. Anag with his entire family came to Armenia and befriended the Armenian king, Khosrov II. And during a hunting party, when they were alone, he stopped to the death, the king, and he escaped. And the king before dying gave order to his princes, kill the entire family of Anag. Only one person escaped this killing. It was Gregory the Illuminator. His nanny took him to Cappadocia of Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea. And he grew up there as a Christian. Meanwhile, when the Persian king Ardashir heard that King Khosrov was killed, he attacked Armenia with a big army. He controlled Armenia and he gave the order to kill all the family of the king. So everybody was killed. Only two people escaped the killing, the son of the king 
whose name was Dartad, and the daughter of the king, her name was Khosrovitu. Both of them escaped from the killings with the help of an Armenian uh, prince, whose name was Amaduni, who took them to Rome. So Gregory grew up as Christian in Caesarea of Cappadocia, and Dirtad grew up in the center of the Roman Empire as a pagan, and he trained as a gladiator, and he became a fa very famous general. So in the year 289, Emperor Diocletian, who hated Christians and began the persecutions against the Christians, gave a legion to Dirtat and told him, go back to Armenia and take back the throne of your father. Back in that time, the road to go to Armenia, he had to pass through Caesarea of Cappadocia. And because it is the tradition that every king should have a secretary to relate his story to the next generations, they present to him Gregory the Illuminator, but they didn't know each other. So here there was the enemy of the two old fathers together went back to Armenia, they conquered the throne of Armenia and they went together to the temple of the Deus Anahid to thank her for the victory that they had. And while the King Dirtat was praying, he saw that Gregory is not praying. And he asks him, why are you, are you not praying? And Gregory tells him that, I don't believe in this God. I believe in Jesus Christ, I am a Christian. And because Dirtat grew up in Rome and he was a vassal king of Diocletian, so he had to do the persecution of the Christians in his kingdom. So he tortured Gregory the Illuminator and in the inquiries, when later on he knew that he is the son of the man that killed his father, he tor tortured him according to the Armenian tradition, 16 kinds of torture. And then he throwed him, the next slide please, in what we call in Armenian, the Khor Vira. You see the monastery on the right side of the picture. This is now a monastery that is built just on the border between Armenia and Turkey. The mount that you're seeing behind the monastery is Mount Ararat, where the Ark of Noe went after the flood. So in this monastery, under the monastery, there is this big pit where Gregory the Illuminator was imprisoned for 13 years. So this prison was a place where when the king, the, the king sent somebody there, nobody had the right to tell the name of that imprisoner in front of the king. If they mentioned the name of the prisoner in front of the king, they would go to join the prisoner in the pit. And they set people over there because they were sure that will, they will not come out alive from that. So according to Armenian tradition, Gregory stayed in that pit miraculously alive for at least 12 years. These are the first two saints of the Armenian nations, but they are not Armenian. Both of them are Romans. The one on the left is Saint Hripsime, and the, the one on the right is Saint Kayani. Both of them, they were nuns from Rome. And it is told that Ripsime was a very beautiful girl and Emperor Diocletian wanted to marry her. But because she was Christian, she didn't want to marry the emperor. 
and she flee with other nuns like her, with Gayane, who was the superior of the group, they flee to Armenia. And by spies, when Diocletian knew that Hripsime is in Armenia, he wrote a letter to King Tertad of Armenia, telling him that there is this group of women in your kingdom. If you find them, kill them. And if you want, there is a beautiful one among them. You can marry her. He was speaking about Haripsim. So of course they find them and they bring Haripsim in front of the king. And because it, as Diocletian was saying to the king, she was very beautiful and the king wanted to marry her, but she refused it. She said, I am Christian and I devoted myself to the Lord. I don't want to be married. And the king was very furious. He tortured her. Then he killed her. It happened that after the killing or the martyrdom of this group of nuns coming from Rome, during a hunting party, Dirtat the king fell from his horse. And according to historians, they say he became like an animal who was escaping from living among people. Nowadays, we call it brain shock or amnesia. But back in that time, they didn't understood it. So they were astonished because they couldn't heal the king. The sister of the king, and this is where providence is coming in. The sister of the king, Khosrovito, in her dream, she, she sees an angel who tells her that the sole person that can save the king from his illness is Gregory. So they go back to the pit and they found out that Gregory is alive. They bring him up and Gregory, after coming out of the pit, he prays on the king and he heals him. After being healed miraculously, the king converts to Christianism. But back in that time, Gregory the Illuminator wasn't yet a priest, he was a layman. So the king sends him back to Caesarea of Cappadocia to be ordained as a priest, then as a bishop, and to come back to Armenia to baptize the king and all the family. And after being baptized, the king declared that Christianity is the national faith of the Armenian people. And that's why we say that in 301, 11 years before the Edict of Milan, that was in 312, that Constantine Emperor gave freedom to the Christian faith in the Roman Empire. So 301, the Armenian nation accepted Christianism as the faith of the nation. And because of this acceptance, the Armenian church was established. This is the what we call the center of the Armenian church. This church actually was built by Gregory the Illuminator after the conversion of King Dertad. And the name of the church is Echmiazin. The meaning of Echmiazin is the descent of the only begotten son of God on earth. So Gregory the Illuminator wanted to build a church after the confession of the king. And he had the vision that Jesus Christ is descending from heaven with a hammer in his hand, and he's knocking on a rock nearby the capital of Armenia back in that time. And after the vision, Gregory told that this is the place where the cathedral of the Armenian nation should be built. And it is called Echmiazin, as I explained, it is where the only begotten son of, the, of God descended on earth.
I spoke about providence. Before being Christian, as Armenians, we didn't have an alphabet. The Armenian alphabet was created because of the Christian faith. Because when Gregory the Illuminator came into Armenia, there were not Armenian priests. There was no Armenian Bible. And the alphabet that the Armenian used to use was the Greek alphabet or the Assyriac alphabet. So after 100 years of Christian life in Armenia, in 404, a monk whose name was Mesrob Mashtots. So this is the church where Mesrob Mashtots, the monk, is sepulchred. If you go into this church, you will see the tomb, which is a place of pilgrimage. Of, mess, uh, of for Armenians in Armenia. It is in the city of Oshagan in Armenia, nearby the capital. So this is Mesrop Mashtots. He is the one that created the Armenian alphabet. And the entire idea of creating the Armenian alphabet was to translate the gospel into Armenian. Because people didn't know Greek in Armenia. They didn't know Syriac. So they were reading to them the gospel in Syriac or in Greek, and people weren't understanding. So Mesrop Mashtot had the idea to create Armenian alphabet and to translate the gospel into Armenian. And he did that in 404 AD. And after the translation of the gospel, the translation was so beautiful that they called it the queen of the translations. This is the Armenian alphabet. It's completely different from any alphabet. It has more letters than the Latin or Greek. It has 38 characters, 38 letters. And the Armenian language is a guttural language. We have a lot of in our language. So this is the alphabet that created Mesrop Mashtots. Why I am speaking about all of this? The intent is that for me, I am convinced 100% that the will of God was involved in the conversion of the Armenian nation. And for centuries, beginning from 301, the date that Armenian nation accepted Christianism as the fate of the nation, the persecutions didn't cease because we were always surrounded with non-Christian countries till now. After this, there was what we call the first war to defend Christian faith. So what happened that in 451, this is Saint Vartan. He was an Armenian general and the priest beside him is called Father Leons Revond. Both of them together, they organized the first Christian rebellion against a pagan king, he wanted to completely eradicate the Christian faith from Armenia. So what happened that during that time, Armenia was between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire on the south. So both empires were willing to control over Armenia. And the Persian king decided that so that I can control Armenia, they have to change their religion because they were Christian, like the Roman Byzantine emperor. So they were related in faith. And the Persian king was thinking that because they are related by faith to the Romans, they will be much more friendly with the Romans. That's why he had the idea to oblige the Armenians to return to the pagan faith that they were 
which is the Mastheism, which is the worship of fire. So in 451, the Persian emperor attacked Armenia with 300,000 soldiers. Meanwhile, General Vartan and his confessor, if you want, Father Levon, had only 60,000 soldiers in their army. But they went and they fought, and both of them were martyrized during the war. But the consequence of this war, which is, which is called the War of Avarair, was that the Persian king was convinced that whatever he will do, he will not change the fate of the Armenian nation. And that's why one of our historians, Armenian historians who actually wrote the history of St. Vartan, as conclusion of the uh, book, his writing, we Armenians, we didn't accept Christianity as a cloth that when it is dirty, we can change it. We accept Christianity as our skin, which is in that detachable from our body. And this is the truth because for almost 17 century now, Armenians are the sole Christian country in the Caucasus surrounded now by the three biggest Muslim countries in the region. But the misfortune is that in the same date that the war of Avarair was, we had the Council of Chalcedon in the church in 451. So because of the war of Avarair, the Armenian church couldn't participate to the Council of Chalcedon. And the consequence of this was that in the Armenian church, there was a division after the Council of Chalcedon. Some of the bishops of the Armenian church accepted the decisions of Council of Chalcedon and others with the Armenian Patriarch rejected back in that time, the Council of Chalcedon. And that's why from that day in the Armenian church, there was this division and we called them back in that time, the Armenian Chalcedonian church and the Armenian anti-Chalcedonian church. Nowadays, the Armenian Chalcedonian church is the Armenian Catholic Church, which is part of the universal church. And the Armenian non-Chalcedonian church is called nowadays the Armenian Apostolic Church. So after the war of Vartanans to defend the faith, this was the map of Armenia. You remember the four or five slides before, we saw that the borders of Armenia was till the Caspian Sea on the east side, no? Look now where it is. You see the red line, how it shrank. And it shrank also on the Western side. So for centuries, Armenia was divided between the Persian Empire on the south and the Roman Empire on the west for centuries. Then after this, it came the Arab conquest. Now we are around 780, 800 Anno Domini where the Arab conquest towards the north is coming little bit up. And now there are three empires among whom Armenia is divided. You have on the east, the Persian empire, the Salardis. On the south, you have the Abbasid Caliphate, which is the Muslim Caliphate, the Arab Caliphate, and on the west, we have the Byzantine Empire, which is the continuation of the Roman Empire, the Christian Empire. 
And in the middle, you have the Armenian kingdom. And this is the fourth dynasty of the Armenians. If you put in the middle of the yellow color, you have the Bakraduni kingdom of Armenia. So this is the fourth kingdom of Armenia, but it wasn't an independent kingdom. It was always a vassal kingdom or sometimes of the Persians who were conquering it, sometimes the Muslim Arabs who were conquering it, or other times under the control of the Byzantine Empire. So to escape all these persecutions, the Armenian flee the ancestral land and they come to the seashore of the Mediterranean Sea. And in 1199, they established the so-called Kingdom of Kilikia of the Armenians, which lasted three centuries from 1199 to 1375. And because the capital was Cis, here in the middle of the map, you can see it, Peter, if you can, yes. Cis was the capital of this Armenian kingdom. Uh, by the way, this would be the, the last Armenian kingdom. So what happened that I said that Echmiadzin, you remember the beautiful cathedral that I show, was the sea of the Armenian church, the center of the Armenian church. Because the kingdom was here, back in that time, the head of the Armenian church moved from the historical site where he was to the capital of the new kingdom and stayed over there till 1375, the collapse of the kingdom of Cis. And what happened after that, under the pressure of the Persian emperor kingdom, the Armenian bishops who were still in the oriental part of Armenia in the historical lands, asked the patriarch to go back to the, his center. And the patriarch told them, I cannot leave my people. Our faithful are living here. How do you want me to go back to a place where there are no Armenians? And he refused to go. And what happened that pushed by the Persian kings, these bishops of Oriental Armenia made a meeting, a synod. And during that synod, they elected the new patriarch. Thus we had in the Armenian Apostolic Church, a new division in 1441, and we had two Armenian Apostolic Church, which is continuing till now. So we have the Armenian Catholic Church with the Patriarch Catholicos, and then we have two Armenian Apostolic Churches. One has the, his center in Armenia, Hmiazin, the old place where Gregory the Illuminator was. And the other one, because of the persecutions about which I'm going to speak, flee from Cis to Lebanon in the Middle East and now resides in Lebanon in the Middle East. So after the collapse of the kingdom of Cilicia in 11, uh, 1375, Armenians were living under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Imagine, for six centuries till 1918, 1920, the Armenian didn't have independence for six centuries. And we were always under the control of the Ottoman Empire. So during these six centuries, imagine no personal power, no king to defend them. So the church was the refuge for the people. The faith was the sole refuge. Regardless all the persecutions that Armenians have endured during these six last centuries, for 600 years, they didn't check from their faith. They remained faithful to the Christian faith. 
and we arrive. I am making it quick because it is very long history. As we say in English, long story short, we will go to 1915, which is a crucial date for us Armenians. So in 1915, this is the map of actual Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. So on the far right side, you have the Gaspian Sea. Then Russia on the north, Georgia, Armenia in the middle, actual Armenia, not historical Armenia, Azerbaijan on the right side, and Turkey on the left. Back in that time, in 1915, Azerbaijan didn't exist historically. So in 1915, you know that the entire world was preoccupied with the First World War. So back in that time, the Ottoman Turks organized and perpetrated the genocide of the Armenian people, which was the first genocide of the 20th century. In this region, there were 3 million Armenians living back in that time. Actually, my grandfather was born here, but I have never been there. He was six years old when the genocide began. And all these right dots that you're seeing, seeing on the map are the places where Armenians were massacred. So as I said, Armenians were 3 million. 50% of the Armenian population was massacred. 1.5 million Armenians were killed during the genocide. And unfortunately, till now, Turkey is not accepting this historical fact. They are denying that their ancestor that did this genocide. It's almost 108 years that has passed and they didn't accept till now this page of their history. The consequence of the genocide was that Armenians flee to the south, to the Syrian desert and Lebanon. A lot of those people who went from the historical Armenia to Syria, passing through the desert of Derezor, died during the trip because on the road, they were attacked by Turkish military and Kurdish uh, soldiers. So those who escaped reached the city of Aleppo in Syria, Damascus and Lebanon. My grandfather arrived to Lebanon at the age of six years old with only his clothes on him, with nothing. My father was born in Lebanon, I was born in Lebanon. And like me, almost 8 million Armenians who are now the diaspora and are spread all over the world. In every country you go on earth, you will find Armenians. Here in the United States, in the region of California, as Armenians, we are 1.2 million almost. And there are some 200 or 300,000 Armenians living on the east side of the United States. More or less, there are some 1.5 million Armenians living in the United States. So what happens the consequence of this? After the end of the First World War in 1917, there was a meeting that is called the Treaty of Sevres in 1920 in France. It took place in France. And because the Ottoman Turks were against the allies with the German forces and they lost war, the big powers back in that time, they divided among them the 
Ottoman Empire. So what you see on the south is nowadays Syria, which is where is what is written French mandate. Now is Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. When it is British mandate, is nowadays Iraq. Then in Turkey itself, different European countries had some enclaves. For example, in the South, there was the French zone, the green and mauve that you're seeing. And on the Mediterranean Sea, there was the Italian zone. And for the Armenians, they gave back the historical Armenian territory, which was uh, designed by the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson, who used to be the president of the United States in the 1920s, he decided that <clears throat> Armenians should take back their historical lands. And this is the map that he drew for Armenia. <clears throat> this Armenian map that President Woodrow drew is large 160,000 kilometers square. And it has parts as a seeing of actual Turkey and Azerbaijan. Actual Armenia, which has the capital Yerevan, can you, Peter, can you saw this? Yerevan is the cap actual capital of Armenia. If you see surrounding Yerevan, there is this tiny line, like the face of a person. This is actual Armenia. And the region of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh is just behind it on the eastern part, where it is written Stepanagel on the east. Armenia is this in the center. Actual Armenia is five times less than the historical Armenia that President Woodrow designed. And the region of nagorno karabakh which was part historical Armenia of historical Armenia, during the Soviet Union, Stalin, who was a dictator, he cut it off and he put it in the Azerbaijani map. In 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Armenian people who were living in nagorno karabakh declared their independence and wanted to relate back to Armenia, the motherland. But Azerbaijan refused it, and the war came out for four years from 91 to 94. In 94, there was a ceasefire. After the ceasefire, the Armenians controlled all this part that you're seeing, uh, the actual orange color and the territory that is surrounding it was all controlled by the Armenians till 2020. In 2020, Azerbaijan backed by Turkey attacked the region, took part of nagorno karabakh And for 44 days, there was a fight. And the result of these 44 days of fight that there were 4,000 Armenian soldiers who were killed and almost 3,000 Azeri who were killed. And when I am saying 4,000, these are young boys of 18, 19, and 20 years old. When you kill 
young men of this age, you're killing the future of a nation because those were going to become the fathers of the future. So there was a trilateral ceasefire agreement between Azerbaijan, Armenia, sharpened by Russia. And the agreement was that this enclave will be defended by Russian troops, peacekeepers, and there will be a tiny corridor between the region of nagorno karabakh and Armenia. Do you see the red line, the little red line between Armenia? And this is called the Lachin Corridor. This is five kilometer wide territory with almost 20 kilometers long road. And this is the sole road that connects the region of nagorno karabakh where 120,000 Armenians are living with Armenia. And it is the sole road for them to have contact with the entire world. They are completely surrounded. So in December, 2022, Azerbaijan blockaded even this tiny road. Now it is blockaded militarily. So these 120,000 Armenian Christians are starving from already nine months. There is no electricity, no gas, no water, and nutrition is scarce. Already last week, we heard the news about the first death by starvation. It was a 40 years old man. And the misfortune is that the big news agencies are not speaking about this. And the international community is doing nothing about it. So we are trying as Armenians in the United States to speak loudly about this, to ask our friends to help us spread the news, the word about it, so that our government do something about it. There was a meeting of the United States Security Council two weeks ago to discuss the matter, but no decision making was, was done. And uh, Till now, nothing has been done. Imagine even the International Red Cross cannot pass through the blockade to bring medicine for people. What can we do? First thing that I say is we have to pray for peace. And I believe in the strength of prayer. And Jesus is very clear about prayer when he say, when one, uh, two or three people are gathered in my name and I, whatever they ask in my name, I will grant it to them. I ask for prayers so that the Lord will continue to strengthen our 120,000 Armenian brothers and sisters to be strong, to stay strong, regardless the hardship that they are living. By the way, among these 120,000, there are 30,000 children, 20, 25,000 elderly people, 9,000 handicapped, and more than 2,000 pregnant women. And we are already hearing that there, there are miscarriages because of lack of nutrition. For me as an Armenian, I see this as a continuation of the first genocide that happened some 108 years ago. It's the same situation. The word genocide was coined by a Polish lawyer to explain what happened to the Armenians in the, during the First 
World War. So the, the word genocide enter, entered in the literature of humankind because of the massacres that happened to the Armenians in the 20th century. And after 108 years, history is repeating itself. And unfortunately, the governments of the world are like the three monks. I don't see, I don't speak, and I don't hear. And the misfortune is that, as you know very well, there is the war of Ukraine now, no? Between Russia and Ukraine. So everybody is preoccupied with this war. And Europe needs gas for the winter. And the gas of Russia is not coming. So they need the gas of Azerbaijan, who is coming through Turkey to Europe. So because of political interests, these 120,000 Armenians are completely forgotten. Second thing that we have to do is to raise awareness about this. Now that we know about it as Christian, it is our duty to speak about it. We cannot be silent about the suffering of our brothers and sisters. As citizens of the United States, I think we have to contact our representatives. Why are we electing them? To uphold the dignity of the human being, to uphold the values in which believe, on which our country is based. And to ask them to do something about it. Because 250 days starving, it's not an easy thing. And I don't think that they will be able to continue because as I said, we're hearing about people who are dying because of hunger, of lack of medicine and other essential things for life. I am thankful to the Lord that we are living in a country that is peaceful. I am thankful to the Lord that we are living in, in a country that is democratic. But as Christians, we have to share the good things that the Lord gave us with other people who are suffering, who don't have that. Again, I repeat, for me as a Christian, as a Catholic bishop, prayer will be the strongest thing that we have in our hands now. But in the same time, we have to raise awareness about it. Thank you for your patience. Now I'm ready for any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Bishop Mikhail. My question is about the, the geography of the region we're talking about. You're saying that the road in is blockaded. So say people wanted to do humanitarian missions, is there any, is there any way to reach by air or what's, what's the geographic situation? You can reach by air till Armenia, but not Nagorno-Karabakh. Because when you go to Nagorno-Karabakh or to Artsakh, you're flying on the airspace of Azerbaijan, which is against any kind of help to go to Artsakh. Actually, there are trucks in front of the blockade waiting from a week there with 400 tons of goods, nutrition, medicines, and other thing that the Azeris are not letting them pass to reach the people over there. Okay. A natural follow-up question from from a lot of people that are writing in: What is Azerbaijan's political goal here with with blocking uh, the corridor? You have to take into consideration that Azerbaijan is ruled from the same family for almost thirty years. The actual president is now uh, from the family of Aliyev, Elham Aliyev. Before him, president was his father. So it is a dictat dictatorship 
in Azerbaijan. And one thing is clear for them, they are putting the Armenians in starvation so that they go out and never come back. They want the land, that's very clear. The, uh, from the other side or the other perspective, this question coming in, just asking, you know, is do Armenians today consider the rightful territory to cover that greatest extent of the historical empire? No. The, as I said, historical Armenia, the Withrow Wilson Road, is 160,000 kilometers square. Actual Armenia is only 29,000 kilometers square, which is five times less than the original one. Every time in history, part of it was taken from it and given to another nation. Uh, it, the majority of it was cut off during the Soviet Union, especially during the regime of Stalin. So Stalin, for what I, I knew, because I forget to tell you that I was the first Armenian Catholic priest to go back into Armenia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 91, when Armenia declared its independence, I volunteered as a priest to go as a missionary back to Armenia. And I served over there for 10 years. And when I arrived there, uh, all of our churches, there was no exception of the old Armenian Catholic churches were all destroyed or turned into granary or stables. And we found in the national library of the capital of Armenia, Yerevan, the calendar, the liturgical calendar of the old diocese of the Armenian Catholic Church in Armenia. And in that calendar, we found the names of the Armenian Catholic churches and Armenian Catholic villages. So I took that calendar in my hand and then drove from a village to another village to find the Catholic uh, villages. And amazingly, they kept their Catholicism. For 70 years, imagine they were under the Soviet Union there was no one Catholic priest over there for 70 years. But people remained faithful to their Christians, Christian and Catholic faith. Uh, when I worked for 10 years over there, I could reestablish some 15 parishes and reestablish the Catholic charities over there. Imagine I began the Catholic Charities Office with two people. I went to Armenia this summer for a visit. They had 280 people working in the Catholic Charities now. I began with two, some 25 years. Now there is 280 people working over there. And the number of the parishes augmented. We have now as Armenian Catholics, 37, parishes in Armenia, 26 of them in Georgia, and five in Russia. So things are changing. It's changing in the places where you can work as a missionary. Mm. But in a place like nagorno karabakh where you cannot go in, it's not easy. Mm. It's not easy. Incredible. Um, another question uh, on, on Russia. What is what is the Armenian perspective on Russia? Are the peacekeepers helpful or should they be doing something more or differently? They should be defending that Lachin corridor, but they didn't. They let just the Azari military to come and take over. It's a misfortune because Russia is now preoccupied with the war that they began in Ukraine. And let me tell you, war is not a good thing. 
that's the worst thing that can happen to a, to a person. As I said, my grandfather fled to Armenia because of the Armenian genocide. My own father had to flee from Lebanon to France because of the civil war in Lebanon. I was 14 years old when the civil war began in Lebanon. For 10 years, I passed my youth, my high school, my university during the war. I lost a lot of my friends during the war for 10 years. War is not a good thing and war is not the solution for the problems. It's wrong. It's very bad thing. Dialogue is the solution. But a dialogue which is not becoming a monologue where the powerful controls everything. Dialogue where the dignity of each person who is participating, be it a person or a country in the dialogue should be respected. If not, there will not be solutions to the problems that we have in the world. It's not only history of Armenia or Russia, or Ukraine. Look everywhere in the war. Where there is no dialogue, unfortunately, war is coming up. Destruction is coming up. Tammy uh, writes in asking what the current position of the United States State Department uh, in the human rights area is. What, what's their current position on, on this? Have, have there been any statements? Cool. Our president, Biden, Joe Biden, declared that he is accepting the Armenian genocide some year ago or two years ago, but it was only a declaration. Nothing was done to prevent another genocide. And uh, as a government of the United States, Till now, there is nothing said directly to Azerbaijan to cease this blockade. That's why we're pushing our representatives mm -hmm. to speak about it loudly. For example, uh, a week ago, I participated to it with the leaders of the Armenian churches, me as the Armenian Catholic bishop, the two Armenian apostolic bishops and the head of the Armenian Evangelical Church uh, with the participation of uh, the Congressman Adam, Sh Adam Schiff of California. We had a press conference in front, of, in front of the Azerbaijani consulate in Los Angeles. And we asked during that press conference, the United States government to do something about this situation. Because as, as I said, it's been already nine months. And if they continue like this, it will end very bad. It will be a catastrophe, which means a genocide. Because you kill people or you let them starve, it's the same thing. You're cutting off the God-given freedom to live on their ancestor, ancestors' territory. Nobody has the right to kill anybody or to take off the freedom of anybody. Bishop, we'll close with uh, another practical question, and that is if you know of any news sources or, or ways that we can keep updated on what is happening over there, of course, as we're uh, you know, in contact with our representatives and trying to spur action, but how can we keep up to date on what's going on? Okay. You can sign for updates on the Philos project forward slash Armenia. There are the news over there. The Philos project forward slash Armenia. In this same time, if you are interested, I had several interviews. The last one was with the, our Sunday visitors just two days ago. And with the Inside the Vatican, the periodical. And I had a 
interview with Raimondo Arroyo on EWTN. Uh, it was back in July, July 11 or 12, if I'm remembering well. So there are resources online and you can go on the website of ANCA, A-N-C-A, which is the Armenian National Committee of America. They have updates every day. Uh, Bishop Mikhail, thank you very much for your time tonight and for, for sharing the, uh, the story, the witness, and the plight of your people uh, with us. It, it's, it's a situation that uh, I myself was unaware of until you know just recently because there is no coverage. And so it is so important now for us who, who have heard of it uh, from you this evening to uh, to make sure that it doesn't end with us and to continue to spread awareness and and uh, and make sure that uh, that it uh, yeah that it is not silent with us. So we we have our mission tonight. Our prayers are certainly with you and uh, and the Armenians. Could you uh, close us in prayer tonight, Bishop? Yes. Let us pray together the Lord's prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May the blessing of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. Amen.